from Utah, the heartland of the Intermountain West, on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. It's SatScene, North America's only satellite video magazine for TVRO dealers and users, with product previews, installation tips, industry news, conversations with TVRO leaders, the technical frontier, and much, much more. It's the state-of-the-art satellite journal in association with Coop's Satellite Digest. Tune in each week for your satellite magazine on satellite by satellite. And now, here's the show. Today we present the first installment in the most important series SatScene has ever broadcast. A visit to RCA's Vernon Valley facility in September of 1978 to learn how a SATCOM flies. Coop and I talked about it down at WIV in Providence Calles two weeks ago. Coop, it was late 1978 when you ventured some 70 miles west of New York City to the RCA Vernon Valley Uplink facility. Now when you went there, you didn't go with as your prime target to tell the story of the uplink. There was a question in your mind. What was that? There probably, in all honesty, there was an ulterior journalistic motive. Right. All right, th okay. that's what you're after, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you've got to go back almost to the day that RCA started making their satellites available to cable, and there were rumors from the very beginning that the RCA satellite, singular in this case, the RCA satellite had a problem. There was something wrong with the satellite. And, of course, that sent tremors of fear through the cable industry, the executives who were in this business, because they were investing their whole future in the satellite working. And if there's any truth at all in the rumors that kept cropping up, that there was something sick about the satellite, then they had a lot to be concerned about, okay? Mm -hmm. um, RCA was very good at telling us there's nothing wrong. Uh, whenever a new fresh rumor would crop up and uh, we would try to run it down journalistically to write about it to belay people's fears, they always had excellent explanations of the fact that nothing had happened, nothing was going wrong. In fact, it always reminded me of the Bob Newhart, Bob Newhart story of the pilot, you know, yes. autopilot, nothing can go wrong, nothing can go wrong, nothing can go wrong. Um, I felt at some point in time that I really needed to go back and visit the facility and see what it was all about. So uh, I wrangled an invitation. RCA provided a, uh, an NBC cameraman out of New York City and their latest TK, whatever it was at that point in time, uh, camera. and. Uh, J. Duke Brown, who was then National Marketing Man Manager for uh, Microwave Associates, now known as MACOM or MACOM, mm -hmm. um, went with me. And uh, you hold in your hands some tapes. Uh, the original tapes that were shot that day, two one-hour tapes, and uh, we went on a full tour of the facility. During that tour, we had the opportunity to get down to some serious questions about the health of the satellite. And um, we had probably done two-thirds of what you hold in your hands at that point. We'd done most of the tour part of it, mm -hmm. and uh, we were down to the interview part of it. And um, bef as we all sat down around the table, you, uh, there were four of us sitting or five of us sitting around the table at one point, and uh, I said, gentlemen, before we roll the tape, I have the latest rumor I'd like to run by all of you, and I repeated it to them. And there was this hush in the room, and then the RCA folks, the three of them, got up and left the room, leaving Jay Duke and I sitting here looking at each other, wondering what was going to happen next. And they stayed outside for about 15 minutes. And we could see them through the glass. Uh, it was kind of a control room facility, carrying on this animated conversation. And they didn't look like they were going to come back. I thought, well, I don't want to blow this. Um, I, I, apparently, there's enough truth in this someplace that they're concerned how they're going to respond when I ask them this question. So in this series of tapes, we will see um, not only a first-class tour of the facility, they do a great job at oh, RCA. Oh, they certainly do. We screened this uh, last night, and it was just magnificent. You are going to learn more about how satellites work, how they fly them, how they keep them in the box, so to speak, and you're going to learn a great deal about the production facility that's right there with the uplink, and you're going to learn about how an uplink works itself. This is the probably the best tutorial tape and it's, it's damn interesting on top of well, everything else. It's probably the most definitive uh, work on the subject that there is in existence. It's also probably the only one, so it doesn't <laughs> say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is the RCA facility as I saw it in late fall of 19, um, 1978. Vernon Valley is in uh, rural northern New Jersey. 
Um, it's, it's been chosen because it's in a natural valley that shields it from terrestrial microwave, mm -hmm. all right? And these two antennas, which you'll see some close-ups of uh, during the course of the, uh, of the um, uh, tour we're about to take, uh, were their link to F1 and F2, that at that time the two primary cable mm -hmm. birds. Now, I would like to leave this introduction only with a suggestion that people not think, because they're not talking about F3, that none of this is germane. All they did when they added F3 to their stable of satellites, and subsequently F4, was simply expand the number of satellites they were controlling from that location. Mm -hmm. All the basics, all the hardware, all the all the, the systems you will see in this are exactly the same today as they were in 1978. Right. And one thing I want our viewers to know, we will cover this over the next several weeks. So it won't be just today. You will see it next week and in the weeks following. It's a serial, as it were. That's right. An RCA serial. Shall we take a look at it? Let's look. Roll it. Very good. Well, Archie, would you explain to us what the uh, control mechanisms are in the satellite and how it behaves in space and how really? you make it behave in space? We sure do. Uh, this little model here gives you an idea of what the SATCOM spacecraft looks like. It's uh, made out of pewter and has some detail in it that we can see here. For instance, the feed horns. This is the antenna that, of course, is pointed toward the Earth at all times. And this is the solar array. This space from here to here is about 37 feet. Distance across that box is about 6 foot. So it's a pretty large structure. I think for some of the things I'd like to show you, it's a little bit easier to show with this other model, which is less fancy, but uh, is easier to we can move the solar array and some other things on it. As I noted before, this is the antenna structure. This is pointed toward the Earth. The spacecraft goes around the Earth in this manner. It can pitch. And it also is tilted this way and roll as necessary to, to uh, keep it pointed at the Earth. The solar array is always pointed at the sun. So as the spacecraft is going around the Earth in this manner, the solar array is turned to keep it pointed at the sun at all times. Now the solar array is just about at the, the place where it is uh, this time in the morning. It's facing toward the east, and uh, the uh, is receiving the power from the sun, of course. But these panels rotate automatically. Is They're it? rotated automatically. Yeah. It's something that's uh, kind of like a big clock motor that just drives it around once every 24 hours. We I go see. around the Earth once every uh, 24 hours, and of course the sun uh, to keep it on the sun, it's driven once every 24 hours. There's a large wheel in here. It's about two and a half pounds. It is spun to uh, maintain the spacecraft attitude and pitch. And as you said, it's a rather elementary Newtonian physics where every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So if we change the speed of the wheel, we're going to move the body of the spacecraft. Yep. To control the spacecraft and roll, we have a large coil of wire wrapped around this part of the, uh, the body of the spacecraft. By passing an electric current through that coil, we can interact with the Earth's magnetic field, and we tilt the spacecraft down or up as necessary to keep it pointed at the Earth. If, for some reason, a solar flare, magnetic disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field, we get out of the range of control of the magnetics, we can then fire these thrusters in order to uh, correct the roll. This is done very infrequently. Uh, last month, maybe 14, 15 times uh, during the entire month was it necessary to do that. What sort of force do you generate in the thrusters if you use the thrusters? It's a very tiny force. Uh, those thrusters have about a tenth of a pound thrust. When we do a roll control, we do about a 50 millisecond pulse. So it's, uh, it's a very short very, pulse. Very, very light touch. Very, uh, light touch. We yeah. give it to, to push it back up. Yeah. And these these coils in here are generating a magnetic field that interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, right. and that very minute reaction is sufficient to reposition. That's correct. It's not very much force, but uh, when you're when you're sitting out there, 22,300 miles above the equator, it just is not going to take much uh, of yep. a push to move it in one uh, one direction or the other. So very we good. can maintain in a very stable attitude uh, with that kind of a system. Now, as you probably remember, the Earth's uh, gravitational field is not constant throughout. Uh, throughout the Earth, it's stronger over the large land masses and it's less over the ocean. Yes. Both of these spacecraft are on the equator over the Pacific Ocean, west of South America. Now, the F-2 spacecraft is due south of Los Angeles, the F-1 spacecraft is a little further west. So they tend to keep wanting to come eastward toward the large land mass of South America. Right. So we fire thrusters and we push them westward. It turns around and about three weeks later it's back to the eastern edge of the box and we push it again. Now, how large is the excursion? Okay, nominally, we have filed with the FCC a box that's a tenth of a degree in east, west, and north, south. That's about 90 miles on a side. 
actually we maintain the station keeping a little closer than that like point zero seven degrees so we're in the region of about a seventy mile square box or so on our station antenna on the ground would look at a change off more site of less than a tenth of a degree yes from this standpoint less than a tenth of a degree should not even see the spacecraft motion in normal normal operation would not see it at all the other kind of correction that has to be done and incidentally we have twelve thrusters on the spacecraft four on this face four on this face and four on the top for drift correction the east-west correction we fire the thrusters on the sides on the east or west face of the spacecraft now the other thing we have to compensate for is the fact that the spacecraft orbit is like a great big flywheel we are normally lined up right on the equator zero degrees inclination however because of the forces of the Sun it tends to precess this flywheel and tilt the whole orbit so the twelve to twelve hours of the day we're north of the equator and twelve hours of the day we're south of the equator when it gets to about point oh seven degrees inclination we fire these thrusters on the north face we precess the orbit over to about point oh seven on the other side and we let it let the Sun drive it back and which time we do another maneuver how often does this occur it depends on the time of year right now we're in the equinox season the Sun is pretty much lined up with the equator and we only have to do it about every ninety days in the summer or winter solstice when the Sun is above us or below us we have to do it about every thirty days so you're not constantly firing the jets no we're not normally in east-west maneuvers are the most frequent there about every three or four weeks so in the normal conditions we're not firing jets only at those at those intervals now all of the time that the spacecraft is operating it is transmitting down to us and telling us all the things that are going on within the spacecraft there are a hundred and twenty eight points within the spacecraft that we're monitoring the data coming down from the spacecraft is updated every two seconds so we get a continual picture of what's going on in the spacecraft now this information is displayed to the spacecraft controller who is behind me at the console here we have some duplicate displays above our head I think what we should do now is we can go up and look at that display and give you some idea of the kinds of things that we're looking at okay this display is a summary of some of the major important points on the spacecraft for instance we have three batteries on the spacecraft these are the voltages of the three batteries thirty point five thirty point seven at this minute thirty point four you notice the line runs through it that's every two seconds those points are being updated now we were in eclipse last night we're in eclipse season we had a sixty three minute eclipse last night and these are the currents we're still charging batteries they're about six tenths uh... amp apiece uh... charging current we could charge them at a higher rate and get this done faster but it is uh... uh... much easier on the batteries to do it in this manner during the at the end of the eclipse last night our battery state of charge which is this number here was down to about eighty ampere hours half of the spacecraft capacity so that we were in, uh, have plenty of power we're right now up to twenty eight point eight when the batteries are fully charged, we'll have 36 ampere hours later this afternoon, and we'll be ready again for tonight's eclipse. As we go over here, we can see that the temperatures of these three batteries, battery one is at nine degrees centigrade, battery two is at three degrees centigrade, and battery three is at two degrees centigrade. Going down to the next row here, or did, excuse me, what is the significance of the difference in temperatures between those three values? Uh, mainly physical location in the spacecraft. They are fairly low temperatures right now because we are charging the batteries, but the, the, the three batteries are physically located in different parts of the spacecraft, so the, the temperature varies slightly. Yeah. Uh, down on the next row here, this is the voltage on the load bus. This is the voltage coming off of the solar array. It's 35.4 volts. The current to supply all the loads in the spacecraft is approximately uh, 15 ampere. Now one of the things that we have that's really a big plus in this spacecraft is that we have plenty of power. We have sufficient power to carry all 24 transponders through uh, the eclipse season. In fact, we have surplus power, and this ISH stands for the shunt current. And there's 2.2 amperes that we're dissipating in some shunt transistors uh, in the central body of the spacecraft because it's extra power. Uh, actually, during the uh, during the uh, summer time here when the Sun is on the north face of the spacecraft we even turn the spacecraft of the solar array off the Sun by about 25 degrees so that we're dissipating less power into the spacecraft 
uh, going uh, down here to the other end of this line, we're looking at some of the spacecraft attitude errors. Now, you notice we talked before about the roll and about the control of the roll. We're showing right now that we have a negative 0 0.04 degree roll. That's four hundredths of a degree, very small roll error. It's pointed down slightly. That's a negative roll. Uh, we're showing a pitch error there of 2.45 degrees. Actually, that's a little misleading because we have a pitch offset in the spacecraft of 2.45 degrees to optimize the uh, communications uh, footprint on the Earth. So what you're seeing in, in terms of pitch error is about a, a thousandth of a degree. Uh, going down here to the bottom on the right side, it uh, showed you that uh, uh, with the spacecraft before that the solar array was pointing toward the east side, you notice that the fuel line temperature on the east side of the spacecraft is about three degrees warmer than it is on the west side of the spacecraft because the sun is on that side. I think um, we could talk a little bit about uh, maybe the general, general life of the spacecraft. There are two things that uh, determine the major factors that affect the life of the spacecraft. One is batteries and the other one is fuel. By this, fuel, you mean uh, this the is the hydrazine fuel that we use to fire the thrusters, the gas jets, yeah. that we use for maneuvers and for roll control and so on. The design life of the spacecraft was for seven years. We right. had seven years of fuel on board. We feel now that we have approximately nine years fuel. Our usage of fuel has been below what we have expected it to be, and we figure that we have probably enough fuel for nine years on board the spacecraft now. Okay. How are the batteries? Uh, well, the other behaving? factor, of course, is the batteries. Uh, the batteries have been uh, performing uh, in an outstanding manner. As you can see, we're going through eclipse season right now with very little, no yeah. difficulty at yeah. all. You're actually dumping excess power now into shunt loads, and you have plenty of power to do this, uh, the, the magnetic field current adjustment. Oh, yes, uh, that's a very small amount. Our biggest yeah. part of the load, of course, are the transponders, where some right. spacecraft during eclipse season, they have to turn off some of their transponders. We can carry all yes. of them through eclipse season without any problem whatsoever. Excellent. And in fact, what's even nicer about it is we can launch this high-capability spacecraft on a Delta launch vehicle, which uh, makes it uh, even more economical from our standpoint. All right. Um, how can you can you say anything about the the uh, TWTs that are in the transponders and uh, your expectations for life on the TWTs? Well, of course, these are uh, supplied to us by a, a manufacturer of TWTAs that. Uh, has uh, burned them in on an extremely long period of time, uh, hundreds of hours, and they are flight rated uh, right. when uh, when we receive them. When I say we, uh, as you probably know, another division of RCA, RC Astro Electronics Division built this spacecraft for us, right. and they bought the uh, TWJs uh, from Hughes, and then they integrated them into the spacecraft. We uh, we feel that uh, well, this is a, a good communication system, and we're uh, we're hoping that uh, it continues and has a long life. Okay, it's looking good at this point. Then. We're looking very good. All right. Is this uh, unit here? Uh, well, that's a thruster. Yes. That's a big one. I mentioned before that we have a 10-pound uh, thrusters on our spacecraft. This happens to be a 5-pounder. We could not get uh, hold of one of the, the extras of the 10-pound thrusters. But it is basically uh, the same as ours. It has a nozzle on it like this, and the body of the spacecraft, the body of the, uh, the uh, thruster where the valve turns it on and off, Actually, if we look at the physical size of it, our thruster is probably more about the size of the fuel line on this one. It's well, it very a, small. A cone shape it's the same, yeah. same shape, but it's, uh, yeah. it's smaller than this. Uh, the how, how many of these are on the spacecraft? We have 12 of them on the spacecraft. All the other we have four on the east face, four on the west face, and four on the north face. Right. We use the east and west face for our uh, uh, drift and eccentricity control, and we use the uh, uh, four on the north face for uh, uh, inclination control. Kind of a matter of interest that the spacecraft, of course, it's a rather hostile environment. It is, and in order to do th the thermal control of it, it's it's covered with a blanket of mylar material. It's gold on the outside to reflect the sunlight, and it's multiple layers of a very thin uh, metallic uh, mylar uh, material. It's used as an insulating blanket. This happens to be one that goes over one of the uh, one of the thrusters. They're sewn together and. Uh, they're snapped onto the side of the spacecraft with a Velcro strip. <laughs> we don't have to worry about the wind at that altitude. Right. <laughs>